cat stopped in the middle of the path and then it stared straight at me. I was terrified. It all bring a tear to my eye thinking about it, just my emotion that I felt that day. I just froze. <laughs> didn't want to move because I didn't want it coming towards me or anything, something like that. You think, where the hell has that come from? Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hi everyone, and welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We recently heard from the journalist Tristan of Bristol Live newspaper. He talked about some past big cat sightings across southwest England, including Somerset. Well, for this part of the show, we're back in Somerset again, because our next guest is Jane, who is based in Somerset, and we're going to hear about a big cat encounter she had in February this year, 2023. Jane, thanks for coming on the show. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I've got 80 mile an hour winds at the moment, so worry about the roof's going to fly off. It's a very volatile, windy evening in southwest England at the moment. Very windy, yeah. Yeah, and actually it sometimes brings the big cats out because their prey are disorientated on windy nights, so the deer can be a bit sort of bewildered. Really? Honestly, yeah, that often happens. That's a known factor in big predators' activities. Wow. Yeah, you think they're going to be uncomfortable and won't bother and they'll use up a lot of energy, but they can find it to their advantage, so yeah, you never know. Well, thank you for coming on at short notice, Jane, and it's interesting to hear that you had a sighting with other people. I think we'll hear all about it in a minute. Before it happened, Jane, did you know anything about big cats in Britain or was it a complete bolt from the blue? I have a friend who is very interested in big cats. We work together, but I've never really taken much notice of those conversations. I've just listened to him and I was intrigued by what he was saying, but it's not really something that I've followed. So he's really the closest that I've come to someone being interested. And then I've worked at Glastonbury Festival, had artists on there, and there's been a couple of people that have seen something. Stagehands and the crew, the roadies, have often said they've sighted them. And you think, oh, you know, whatever, probably they were a bit tipsy or something. You just think it's festival time. You're probably going to see a lot of things. It's not something that I would have gone out to look for, but now I'm, I'm a, it's a little bit different now. You're eating humble pie. Yeah, I kind of am. I think I'm going to listen more closely to my very good friend when he talks about it. There was a piece in the Southwest and went to national newspapers and media and websites last summer, just at the start of Glastonbury. One of the people preparing the site claims he saw one and it was disturbed and flushed out of cover when they were putting up some of the kit. You can understand that happening if one's lying low and there's lots of disturbance on the site. That could happen. Yeah, I mean, the Glastonbury site is so huge. They take over so much of the countryside. When you come down the hill and you see the whole you know, thing lit up, it goes for miles and miles and miles. So I'm sure there's places that people don't generally wander through. It's got to be places that are left untouched for, for most of the year round. So I'm sure it does disturb quite a lot of the wildlife. I tried to find that person who was in the newspapers with the alleged sighting because I thought it'd be great for the podcast and we actually have a listener and a contact of mine who is just about the most senior person in the event organizing process of Glastonbury so he knew all the different crews to try so he did spread the word and he tried to get contact with that guy he didn't come forward so we couldn't have him on the podcast so my contact who was one of the show coordinator people he was saying that um, when they're doing all that prep and the fencing and all the infrastructure assembly, they do have to make sure that every single last sort of deer on site is flushed out away through the last gap in the big fencing. Yeah, so they're not trapped inside. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, very dangerous. So flush out the prey and flush out the predator with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, if you could take us through your event, because I gather you were on a run early morning... Yeah, I'm part of a running club in Froome and we go out every morning. We gather about seven o'clock and we're out on the road by about quarter past. And we go down a road and then we go off 
trail running and we often go down we have lots of different routes that we go we don't go the same route every week but one of our routes is down an old disused railway track which is quite covered in a lot of trees and it's quite wild it's certainly not a walker's place and I stop as I often do because I'm not the best runner in the group I stopped to blow my nose actually because it was quite a cold chilly morning and as I looked up and a couple of people had stopped with me because it really was quite cold that morning looked up I did a double take and we all were looking in the same direction and could not believe what we'd seen he was walking I say he it just seemed like a he but the cat was walking towards us but almost in profile and it was the tail that was so incredible the way it was just hanging like couldn't possibly be any other animal but a big cat there's no way it could be anything else it sort of stared at us for a while and we were all quite stunned into is everyone seeing the same thing you know and then it looked at us and then just casually walked into the, the sort of wooded land and off it went and we were all just did everyone see that? And we were all like, yes. Did anyone get their phone out? No. And we just sort of carried on our run almost in silence for about a couple of minutes. And then we all started to discuss it. And everyone then started saying, well, I've heard, you know, people have said, but I've never seen one. None of us had ever seen one before. And all a bit like me, sort of listening to people telling you they've seen big cats. You're like, right, okay. But there was no question what it was because there's just no dog like a huge dog like that I don't know what it would be apart from like a great Dane or something and it's just such a different shape in fact they're not as tall as great Danes actually no exactly they're they're smaller aren't they more sleek and more it's just the way they move and they sort of the pads the way it was plodding and it was quite amazing you mentioned the tail. Can you finish off the description of the tail? The tail hung down and up and it was just so kind of graceful. That's what it was. You know, a dog's tail wags and it's all, you know, busy, but this tail was so sleek. It was almost like it was a cartoon drawing. It was so cat-like. It was incredible. But the length and the thickness of the tail? It came to a blunt end. It didn't seem to taper off. It was powerful. That's the bit for me. Could you envisage it taking down a deer and eating a deer? I think that's the reason we were stunned into silence because it was very powerful and it was it was quite arrogant in its <laughs> way at us. It was definitely a predator, 100%. And it looked at us and then decided to ignore us. But I wouldn't say it was looking at us in a friendly way. Not at all. It was quite, not vicious, but it was definitely standing its ground. Yeah, I would say that could definitely take down a deer, 100%. I don't know if you've ever seen the big Labradoodles are quite large, massive size. There are some big ones of those. It would be that kind of coming between, not a wolfhound, but just, you know, smaller than a wolfhound, but not so tall. It's like, you know, shorter fatter legs almost but yeah big I would definitely say big to describe it what kind of distance away from you was it had it turned and come for you how much time would you have had it would have got to us extremely fast yeah it would have got to us in seconds if it had run it would have got to us we were quite close to it because what it had done it come out of one wilderness gone on to the track which is when it saw us and then went on. So it was kind of crossing our path. So it wouldn't have noticed us, apart from my nose blowing, which is probably what made it turn. We weren't talking. It's early morning. We don't like to make too much noise when we're running through the country. So in case we and disturb anybody or, or animals, whatever. So we were quite close to it. We were probably about three big trees away from it. That's the only way I can describe it, really. Do you think it was disturbed by you guys coming by the vibration of your noise or whatever running and then you flushed it out or do you think it was complete coincidence that you converged yeah I think 
was coincidence because it felt like he was just crossing the railway track and we happened to be there and I blowed my nose and, you know, he looked. It was sort of like, oh, who are you? And then just turned and walked off. Certainly didn't run away, just walked. Was not disturbed by us. It was very cold. And as I say, we weren't making a lot of noise. You know, no one had music blaring from a phone or anything. We just stayed absolutely still when it looked at us. Nobody moved. Do you think it was just going from A to B? It wasn't in full-on hunting, stalking mode. It was more just travelling A to B, was it? No, it didn't look like that. It looked like it had just woken up and was going off to to go somewhere. I don't, I don't know what, whether they whether they hunt at night or they have in the daytime, but it looked like it was travelling somewhere but not chasing any animal. And you presumably were some of the first people out in the morning if it was very early morning, which is a good time to see them. There aren't many people around that area that we go, apart from runners. I don't know why anybody would actually be going down there because it doesn't go to anything, just around the railway. And at night time, presumably, it's got that kind of route to itself, completely undisturbed. Yeah, because there's no there's no cars. You know, there are no cars around there. And I can't imagine anybody. I mean, I certainly wouldn't walk there on my own. I only, I only go there because I'm with a running group. But it wouldn't be somewhere you choose to walk alone. Yeah, we often think they use those kinds of routes as quick, linear access from A to B as a line of least resistance, you know, just like they're convenient for people to use as jogging trails where they're convenient for wild animals to quickly get from A to B before they turn off to where they need to get to. You said it was arrogant, so it seemed truly wild and not one fresh out of captivity. What do you reckon? At a guess, I would say it was a wild animal just because of its body language and the way that it was. But I'm not sure what the difference is between an animal that's in captivity they always look distressed to me. So this one certainly didn't look distressed. It did look arrogant. It just looked like we were interrupting whatever it was doing. And did it seem healthy, by the way? Did it seem lean and fit and healthy? It was stunning. The word I would use, it was absolutely stunning. For what reason? Muscularity and sheen and that sort of thing? Everything about it was beautiful. We all said the same thing. My goodness, wasn't that a beautiful animal? It was all over black, largely, was it? If I had to say an absolute colour, I would say black to very dark brown. Black would be the way I would say it, but if I had to be pushed to a shade of black, if there is one, that kind of almost licorice colour, if you know what I mean. Have you looked up in books or on websites to match it with known species? No, I haven't. I didn't really look at anything. I was just wanted to remember it in my memory, to be honest, and I didn't really want to start looking at things and then go, oh, I've just tried to keep it, because I think it's something that I probably will never forget, and I'd like it to stay that way. Do you know what I mean? The mystique of it, yeah. (laughs) Would panther be an apt description, very generally, that you reckon you saw? From panthers that I've seen in the zoo, that was definitely one for me. That's what I thought it was. We all said the same thing. Okay. You all referred to it as a panther, did you, together? Yeah, we did, yeah. How helpful was it to have co-witnesses, to be with other people watching it, for subsequently being believed and being confident you could tell people? It was, because you think you're seeing something. You think you're seeing things. Like, is it... I say, everyone went silent and then kind of like, when it moved away, sort of looked at each other and like, did you see that? And then was like, yeah, did you? Like, yeah. It was quite good. I didn't think I'd gone mad. The other people on the run, the people that caught up with us afterwards and the ones that we caught up because we were like in the middle of the run, they were very upset they hadn't seen it. <laughs> I guess they believed you because there were three of you with the same story and they could see your emotions as well. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah. But actually, when once we'd all kind of got back together, we went off for a coffee and breakfast afterwards. They, um, they'd all said that there's been so many suggested sightings of it around the area that they thought it wasn't going to be long till someone on the run saw it. But I think it's taken something like I think the run's been going for about four and a half years. So this is the first time someone on the run has actually seen it, rather than being told be careful because there has been cat sightings. 
I had not heard the gossip, to be honest. How quickly did you think, oh, this is brilliant, I must tell my mate James? About a week later, I was chatting to him, we were talking about work and stuff, and I said, oh, by the way, I saw him, and he was like, what? You, what? <laughs> you haven't told me? And I was like, well, I've forgotten about it. My running life and my work life are so separate that, you know, you go running for your sanity, and then you come back to work, and you kind of, it's not until the next week that you're putting your gym shoes on, you remember it? And so I was telling him, and he was absolutely, you know, he was so, like, excited the work stuff we were supposed to be doing just got completely pushed aside the whole conversation turned out to be a cat conversation he questioned me about everything literally every detail and um he was quite quite mad so he he was quite pleased he was very pleased that he had now had a friend that had seen one and he recruited you for this for this now which is good on him so uh, that's nice he did yeah he, he put me in touch with you and said you must tell your story and so I, I thought, well, actually, when you've seen something so amazing, you probably should share it because it is quite incredible. It's, as I say, it's something I'll never forget. And I do always look out now on the run, but I haven't seen anything else. What about this business of taking a photo? You now realise how difficult it is because how long did you have, would you say? Say one of you was quick on the draw for a, a smartphone camera. I would say from the time it came out of the first undergrowth to then register that this was not a dog, a sheep. Because first of all, you see something moving and you immediately assume you're seeing a, someone's dog. And then when we realised that it was not, and it turned and looked at us and moved away, you're talking 30 seconds of actual time when you've registered it's a cat to the time it's left. So we were all quite scared as well because it was a big animal and we weren't that far away I mean had we gone for something who knows what it would have done so it really wasn't my first thought it was just afterwards it was kind of like did nobody take it but you know you don't run with your phone in your hand you'd have to have gone into your pocket you know the side pocket of your your running trousers or you know and then you've got to turn it on there's no way you would get unless you had the camera in your hand and you're a wildlife photographer I don't think you'd get that. I think it is that mental processing time that takes 10 seconds to go through dog and other options. If we could do away with that first 10 seconds, we'd be getting more of them on our phones, even though they wouldn't be that close enough to be that brilliant. But it's that early processing time that takes the time that prevents the, the phone camera being used, I think. And emotionally, what did it make you feel? Obviously, a formidable predator in the wild, in the British countryside. For a lot of people, that's worrying. But now you've actually seen it for real and it's not abstract. You know there's some truth to the rumour, as it were. How has it made you feel about these cats being wild? It was a bit of adrenaline almost, seeing it, when I realised what it was. Now, when I'm running, I do... I was running down another railway track. The running group split up to go because we go about seven and a half K and a couple of them wanted to do a 10 and a half K. And I wasn't really into doing another <laughs> two and a half K. So I said, well, I'll go this shorter route. And I ran down a hill, which is another railway track. And I almost thought I could hear something in the bushes sort of traveling with me. And I was thinking, well, if that's a cat, I'm in deep trouble. But it clearly wasn't. But, you know, I was just thinking, now I'd seen one, I was thinking, my goodness, you could just be so close to one. It's not like you just look and see if it's a fox or a bird or whatever. You're thinking, is that, a, you know, so it does, it has maybe a bit wary of going off track and the run, but not that I wouldn't do it, but just a little bit more wary than I have been. I think they just keep themselves to themselves. I think that arrogance is kind of like they must know not to mess with people i suppose they just stick to their own yeah there's so many deer and rabbits and pheasants yeah. and so if somebody was going to be hired to rid the area of it and any more how would you feel if they were going to be eradicated as difficult as that would be how would you feel do you feel protective of it oh yes 100% I'm a vegan, so I 
don't eat animals anyway. So I, w- I would pretty much do, you know, anything to protect animals. So no, I would. I think I would be awful if someone tried to track it. That would be terrible. So you're happy with them being living wild if they're behaving themselves? Well, I mean, if I am the norm and people that say they've seen them have seen what I saw, I have not heard of anybody being attacked by one. So I think we're just learning to live alongside each other, I suppose, really. Would you say that would go for your other co-witnesses, the people who saw it with you? Yeah, I think they. we all felt quite honoured to have seen it. Nobody seemed to be thinking about calling up the authorities and saying they'd seen a cat go and track it down. Nobody had that kind of reaction. No, not at all. Has it added interest and excitement to your view of the countryside now? You say you're on alert. Some people say that although that puts them on the edge, it's to some extent it's actually beneficial because they like being more alert. Is that occurring to you? Is that happening to you at the moment? Yeah, I think that's a very good way of explaining it. It is quite it is quite nice to be more alert because I am thinking a bit more about where I'm going and what I'm doing. But women have had to deal with predators from the time you're born. So for a female, it's just another predator. You know what I mean? You're having to you know, walk down the street, you hear footsteps behind you. You're praying the guy is going to cross the road because you only assume that that person is a predator don't mean to sound sex or anything but a man cannot imagine what that feels like you know I know there's plenty of men that have been attacked and I'm not suggesting for one minute that it's just female but 99% of attacks on women are by men so we are always on our guard so it sort of isn't too different to that but it's a wild animal not a man. Yeah you go about your lives knowing there are threats about. Yeah So you're always kind of like got your keys in your hand when you get to your door because, you know, you don't want to spend two seconds putting your hand in your bag looking down. It's that same thing. It's like when I was running, I was I was just thinking, just keep going. Don't turn around. Don't look in case it is another cat. And I got to the end of the road and then all the other runners came around the corner. And I was like, I'm glad you're here because I heard something in the bushes. And they were like, oh, Jane, you're not going to see it again. You know, we were laughing about it. But it just did make me think. Because normally I run down routes like that and you hear something in the bushes and you think, oh, it's just a fox. But it just crossed my mind that could actually be another cat. So I probably shouldn't stay around uh, and dawdle. Well, thank you for that perspective. And that hasn't come up on the podcast before about the female, the threats and perception of threats that females over males would have in their lives. And it's an important angle. So thank you for that. Yeah, that is probably the one difference in male and female, actually, I think, more than anything, that it's the predator thing. You've just been brought up to be aware that you have to be ready for that and make sure that you don't put yourself into any danger. So that's probably a good thing, I suppose, really, in life. The other thing which people often make a decision on after an event like this is whether they tell people or not. And there might be different reasons for not saying it. Sometimes people worry that it's going to affect people's perception of them and your status in life. And so people think, you know, I'll just be guarded about it and I'll very much decide who I'm going to tell and who I won't. And the other reason is that some people don't tell others because they don't want to draw attention to the area for people who might come with um, ill intent for the animal or just because the area might be disturbed. Did, did you make any decisions about that sort of thing? I told people that were close to me, well, obviously I told James and I, you know, I told my family, And but my daughter was on the run with us and she was one of the witnesses. So we were both in that situation. There were two other male runners and my daughter. We kind of had each other to pinch and say we actually did see it. And I suppose if it came up at a dinner party, someone mentioned it, I would offer it up as I probably wouldn't tell them, you know, where it was just because you're right. We wouldn't want people going there trying to find it. But I've never really been worried about what people perceive me as because I've got past that age of worry. (laughs) Yeah. um, But do you feel some people have been polite in accepting uh, what you say, but maybe they don't quite believe you? Have you had any vibes of people being surprised or it's beyond their comfort zone when you tell them? 
I've usually told people that are interested in that sort of thing. The common denominator is that's exactly the kind of place you would see them when I've said it. And so they kind of make you feel like they believe you. One of the guys that looks after my garden and I was telling him and he was very interested and he said exactly the same as James, you know, the train line and the wooded area and the cold and the morning and all the things that I mentioned, they all seem to be, for some reason, common denominators. I tend not to talk to people that aren't going to be interested in something just because you're probably wasting your breath if you know someone's not, you know, what's the point, really? Are you OK about them potentially naturalising as big predators across Britain? I mean, you said that individual one you're OK about, but more generally, do you think it's OK? If it came to it that they were killing people or there was farmers were losing their animals, obviously your opinion is going to change. But at the moment, it doesn't seem to be harming anything. It's life, isn't it? And that's coming from a vegan. So it's hunting for food rather than hunting for other reasons, you know. So it's not bothering me at the moment, but obviously I'm, I'm up for having my mind changed if circumstances change. Well, it'll be interesting to see if um, there's any future sightings. Whenever we go down the train line, we're always looking out. I'll let you know if I see it again. Or recruit anybody else who sees it so we can have them on. 100%. Great. Thank you ever so much, Jane, for coming on the show. OK, Rick. Thank you very much. For our second half, we welcome back Mark Graves. We had a long chat with Mark recently in episode 95, mainly hearing about his time in South Africa tracking and living alongside leopards. And we're going to hear about the time he had a crocodile incident back in South Africa, so he knows what it feels like to be treated as prey. So, Mark, welcome back. Thanks for coming back so swiftly on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me back, Rick. Uh, It's a pleasure to be back and, and a pleasure to be back so quickly. You visited myself and four other people have been on the podcast, actually, in Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire Investigators, just this weekend gone. And so, Mark, what did you make of the Gloucestershire big cat country landscape and the hotspots we took you to? Firstly, thank you, because it was uh, a great introduction to some of your extended team. I've now met a couple of them up in Herefordshire and, and, as you said, four more now in the Stroud area in, in Gloucestershire. I have to say, you you have some extraordinarily passionate and dedicated citizen scientists as a part of your larger network, which is fantastic to see. So it was very nice to meet them and to share experiences with them. But yes, going to your question of the area, a fascinating area. The thing that probably struck me the most was just how populous that part of the Cotswolds is. But at the same time, there are these long belts, strips of potential wildlife corridors on the drop-off from the escarpment down to the the river floodplains. And they sort of wrap around these valleys and sort of amphitheaters all the way along scalloped terrain. Although hugely busy with dog walkers and people out for the bank holiday weekend, still plenty of space. You didn't have to walk far off the beaten track to pick up the deer game trails, to be away from people and in areas that were ideally suited to big cats. Yeah, and of course at night time, those areas are going to be far less busy. So any cat that's worried about disturbance just has to lay low five minutes, walk away night time, it's going to be fine. So I think it is just such a higgledy-piggledy landscape, isn't it? And of course on the, some of those edges, the edges of the habitats, that like the commons, where the common grassland goes into woodland and everything, and scrub, there are people's gardens as well. So it, it is um, scattered, uh, scattered residential situations as well. Absolutely. And have got to also remember that from the anecdotal evidence we're starting to gather now with several sightings of youngsters and sightings of animals being in areas for 30 or 40 years would suggest that we have got animals breeding, which would mean that they're growing up in those areas. That's their natural habitat. They know nothing else. They're not coming from a, a foreign wild environment. They're growing up in that environment with those people around them and with those disturbances and 
challenges around them so that they're just a part of their normal life as they are for all of the wildlife in, in the United Kingdom. Avoiding dog walkers and avoiding noisy areas is part of your lifestyle as a growing up leopard or puma in the British landscape. Absolutely and I'm sure just like foxes and badgers and many other nocturnal and crepuscular species you know they're quite happy to come into uh, more urban and, and more populous areas in the small hours to you know find their prey scavenging in rubbish bins or in the prey species that would utilize those rubbish bins so I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they actually utilizing their human habitat as well as their their wild woodland habitat i mean i think we were telling you that two key areas for sightings that crop up are actually behind laybys where there are permanent burger vans they're um, working and active into the evenings and sometimes the land behind a burger van is a bit of a twilight zone wasteland area and you know a cat could be interested in in the smells ar- around there and any discarded crumbs uh, i think it's highly probable right i mean at the end of the day if you, if you think about it if you don't finish your burger or whatever you sort of toss it into the long grass or over the fence or whatever the scraps in the bins there If they're not interested in scavenging the scraps themselves, they're certainly going to be interested in the rats and foxes and and badgers and things that might come for those scraps. So whichever way, whether they're predating on animals coming for the scraps or whether they're going for the scraps themselves, it's got to be a fixed point of interest for these cats, really. Okay. Well, again, when we were sauntering about those landscapes, we were discussing actually the fact that On several occasions, we've actually come across and been sent pictures of filleted out, hollowed out, predated and consumed badgers. Even the people, and sometimes they're badger consultants, real mammal specialists are sending these in because they think it's most likely that a big cat has been responsible for that prey item. The badger looks like a prey item. It doesn't look like it's just died and been scavenged by something. You made the point that, well, the badger's very distinct head markings are this what's called a posomatic coloration. So that would be very good for words of the week. So would you mind explaining that, starting with the badger's head coloration and then get to the term a posomatic coloration and what that's all about? Sure. So the badger is effectively made up of two different colorations. So its face is very distinctly black and white stripes, very obvious and they sharply contrast with each other, those colours, which gives us the term aposomatic. Uh, the rest of it is dull, feathered grey colour, which we would call cryptic or camouflage. So it's actually a sort of half-and-half half animal, which is interesting. I, I know there's been a lot of debate over the years. I, I've read a, a bunch of scientific papers where there's been some thought process that maybe the coloration on the face is, is an identity-marking strategy and, and that one badger can tell another by its face stripes because there are some slight differences in each animal but i think it's generally accepted that that is a posomatic coloration so a posomatic is the use of bright colors or contrasting colors mainly black with either white or yellow or red as a stand out warning sign to would be predators so for example a wasp or or a bee has stark yellow and black Now, that tells a would-be predator, a bird or something, that don't mess with me because I've got a a venomous sting in me. Poison dart frogs, bright red and black, same thing. Don't eat me because I'm poisonous. So with badgers, I think it's generally accepted that their face is an aposomatic coloration. The argument against that, of course, was, well... They are apex predators. There's nothing above them in the food chain. So why would you have a posomatic coloration? Because a posomatic is to warn off a would-be predator. Don't mess with me. I've got a very strong jaw and I can cause you a lot of damage. And therefore, it's better to leave me alone. Especially if you're putting your head into a badger set or something. And the first thing you see is this starkly contrasting head. And it warns you that there's a lot of teeth and a lot of strength behind those teeth. But if you think back to evolution, um, they didn't develop the supposomatic coloration in the last 100 years or even 1,000 years. It takes millennia to change those sort of genetic changes. When they would have developed that sort of coloration, the supposomatic coloration, 
they wouldn't have been the apex predators. There would have been plenty of other apex predators in this country, as we well know. There would have been wolves, bears, and cats. Lynx, for sure. We, you know, if we go back several tens of thousands of years, or maybe a hundred thousand years or so, th- there could have been all sorts of other bigger predators. Yeah, large carnivores. Large carnivores, exactly right. So the fact that they are at the moment supposedly the apex predator doesn't mean that they always were. So yeah, that's how we get to a posomatic. It's a coloration that stands out to say, don't mess with me because I'm not worth the effort, as opposed to a coloration which hides me, which is a cryptic coloration. And we can talk about that another time, the different forms of cryptism. Nature's warning sign, really, in that vivid contrast. Absolutely. And of course, we then get mimics as well. So we get certain animals that will mimic animals that that are venomous or poisonous so that they use, they ride on their tail cave, if you like. So for example, you get a hoverfly, which isn't venomous at all, but it mimics a bee or a wasp to try and hide in in that protection bracket. Of course, there's lots of predator-prey relationships going on in nature, but they're obviously very apparent in a place like Africa. Are there more aposomatic coloration examples in a place like Africa because of that predator-prey ecosystem abundance? Yes, I think probably. There are certain well-known examples there. Here, I think mostly it's black and white. I think you could possibly say a polecat would also have a posomatic coloration. It's fairly unpleasant. So in North America, for example, a skunk would definitely be considered a posomatic because it tastes bad and smells bad. But uh, in Africa, there, there are quite a few, particularly insects, but also a number of reptiles and uh, other species that have a posematic coloration to warn off predators. What about the bright coloration on an adder? Why has evolution given some snakes very vivid colorations? Well, that is a posematic for sure. I think probably the greatest example is the, I think it's the coral snake, isn't it, which has got... Um, bright red and yellow and black banding on it and it's a highly venomous creature and it, and and it's telling would be predators don't mess with me i'm incredibly venomous so but yeah i mean absolutely so very brightly colored reptiles including snakes definitely would be a posomatic um i think patterns strong patterns the adder i think is more patterned and i think funnily enough it's what we would call a disruptive pattern although the colors are very beautiful and striking they're still in the sort of browns and olives and greys and blacks and browns, which are all neutral, natural tones. The pattern is what makes it striking to us. But if you were to put that at a, into a gravelly or a peaty, undergrowthy environment, it disappears pretty quickly with that disruptive pattern. And the black and white stripes on a zebra, is that disruptive because they're more prey than, than anything and they're not venomous and they're, they can't really fight back that well? So is it just that they're trying to show disruptive patterns in a herd situation so the individual is more difficult to pick out and select from a, a watching predator? Absolutely, Rick, yeah. I, I think there's no opposomatic because there's no reason for a predator to fear a zebra over any other prey species but it is very disruptive. There's a huge amount of scientific debate over over the the reasoning for stripes on zebra and its ongoing, from creating differential in heat distribution between the white and the black to to create air movement, to keep them cool, to disruptive. At a distance, they become grey. I mean, if you think about the battleships back in the Second World War and things, they used to paint their antenna in black and white stripes because against the horizon, it breaks that stark line, that unnatural line. So breaking animals in stripe patterns is disruptive and is a form of camouflage. Good stuff. So in terms of our big cats that we're interested in, it is their prey that we're seeing the opposomatic coloration on. None of the cats themselves have got opposomatic. No, they're cryptic. So, I mean, you know, a, a leopard in its natural form has the rosettes. It's a sort of tawny colour with the rosettes. And that, that would be a form of cryptic coloration, which is not to hide from predators, but to hide itself from its prey. Um, same with a, with a tiger. Same with most, if not many, of the cat species. Interestingly enough, the leopards that we are seeing and talking about are melanistic. So they are not in their normal form. They are a, a mutation of their normal form. 
which makes them very dark or jet black, which possibly is a disadvantage. And if it were a leucistic mutation or an albinism mutation, well, albinism is a lack of pigment altogether, whereas leucism is a lacking in pigment in some or most of the cells. So they become much lighter in colour. But there is still some black in them. Well, not necessarily black. Well, yes, yeah, sorry, it's some black, which creates a colour, yes. Yeah. So, for example, you, you can get something, I think it's called a strawberry leopard, which is very pale cream colour, with the rosettes being gingery, reddy strawberry colour. It's an extraordinary looking creature, but that's a, a leucistic leopard. I've seen a mounted one in near where you used to live, near Hood Spray, actually. Very striking. I'll see if I can get a photo of it and put on the website for this episode. That would be interesting. Most animal species will have colour mutation where there are genes missing and that creates this mutation on either the colour or pattern. You get pattern mutations as well. And it's arguable as to whether that's an advantage or disadvantage. I I think with melanism and because leopards primarily are, are nocturnal, crepuscular to a degree, but mostly nocturnal, I guess being black is not really a disadvantage. I would say they're edge habitat predators. Witnesses say how contrasting the black is on, say, sunlit green meadows and pastures, but they're not that often in those. They are more in the woodland or the woodland edge or scrub edge. And I would say if you're a habitat edge ambush predator, being black is is not too much of a disadvantage at all. Yeah, I believe um, in in their native countries, they're, they're very good at moving from shadow to shadow, shade to shade to utilise those dark areas to benefit them during the daytime. Good stuff. We're going to finish on a predator-prey incident which involved yourself. When we did the first uh, podcast uh, interview with you, I didn't know you'd had a crocodile attack. And when I heard that you had, I thought, well, I think listeners would be interested to hear. So sorry to put you through it again, Mark, but it'd be very nice to hear uh, the full story of the crocodile attack and also how it affected you, you know, that before or during and after and the um, after effects, if there were any. Anyway, let's hear the full story if we could. Sure, no problem at all. It came up, actually, because I sent you a, a photograph of an incident where a researcher in, in the Kruger National Park in South Africa had taken a photograph of another researcher just across a, a small rivulet part of the Elephants River. And, and when they got back to camp and they looked at the photographs, there in the water was a three-metre crocodile right next to where this person was standing. And I just said to you, isn't it extraordinary that even if you're in that environment and you're trained to look for these things, you still don't notice a predator necessarily being right next to you. And and I was relating that to how that can be possible with the big cats. And I sent you that photograph because actually a, a friend of mine, another Mark, who I've walked many, many trails with uh, on these wilderness backpack trails in the Kruger National Park, I had an incident with a crocodile a couple of days ago. He's currently in hospital in Nelspruit having his hand rebuilt. And, and I wish him a speedy recovery. And I hope that he gets back to full full strength on that and he's able to get back to his pleasure of walking uh, wilderness trail i forgot that yes that was a reality of it yeah gosh fingers crossed for him absolutely and thank you for that rick and, and yes i mean it does happen it, if you spend the amount of time that we spend walking in big five areas then you are in a continually in a potentially dangerous situation and, and that's the way we like to train guides and uh, we conduct ourselves. We don't see it as being dangerous, but it is potentially dangerous, depending on on how the situation develops, on how we react to it, and how we are trained to deal with it. So it is something that can be mitigated massively through knowledge and experience. And that's what we, we aim to do. But yeah, going back to my, my story, I think I mentioned in the last podcast that I had done a lot of instructing and guiding up right up in the north of the Kruger National Park. So it's actually a an area that is under management of the Kruger. It's a community conservation area owned by the Makaleki people, and it's a fabulous part of South Africa. Because of the nature of the way it's set up, most of the concession is devoid of tracks and is therefore open walking area. I was working for an organization that has a training camp there. 
training walking trails guides and I was the instructor in charge of a graduation ceremony and we spent a day or two setting up additional tents for all of the guests, parents and siblings and stuff to come for the ceremony and it was incredibly hot. It was well in the 40s degrees of temperature. By the end of the day or mid-afternoon, we'd got all the additional camp up. This is an unfenced tented camp in the middle of nowhere, basically. Because it was so hot, my great friend and the head instructor at the camp suggested to me that I took the students and we went to a place on the other side of the concession called Lana Gorge, which has a small stream and a beautiful gorge. And we could go for maybe a little bit of a dip that side. So we got in the Land Rovers, we drove up to the top and walked down into this gorge. I was at the back. The students now are all about to graduate. They've all been through their whole year of training and they are level one field guides. And most of them have graduated as backup trails guides. And a lot of them have worked in that concession in the various lodges over their placement for six months or so. So they knew the area well. And we got down to the bottom of the gorge. There's a tiny little stream running down. Obviously, it flows heavily in, in heavy rains, but it's uh, just a, a trickle at that time of year. And the first thing I noticed was on a little sand patch by the edge of the water was a very fresh lion pug mark. In fact, two of them where the lion had come down to drink. And the water was still seeping into the pug mark, so it was sort of filling up. And I looked at that and I just thought to myself, well, that animal must have been drinking here as we were walking down the hill and it's heard us coming down the hill and it's now moved off in front of us, which means it's somewhere up in these rocks looking at us probably. So I had a quick scan around and uh, didn't see anything, but I thought, interesting, I wonder how many of the students in front of me have noticed this. I walked on down the gorge, probably another 100 meters or so with uh, another instructor and I got down there and I said, guys, um, did we notice the tracks back there? And absolutely no one had noticed them. And I pointed that out and said, look, if we've now signed you off to be backup guides, you should be picking up these kind of signs. They were demob happy, were they, Mark? Is that the excuse? I think that's exactly it. They didn't have their work heads on. They had their sort of play, we're going for a, a dip in the pool kind of heads on. You know, people just hadn't realised that, or they hadn't yet learned that, you know, when you're, when you're out there, you're out there regardless all the time. It was a very good lesson for everybody, including myself. So, yeah, anyway, we got, we got there. I suppose there were 20, 20 something of them, and half of them were already in this rock pool, and half of them were getting into their swimmers and stuff. And I looked at the size of this rock pool, which was quite a decent sized pool. It was probably you know, three or four meters across. So we're talking so 12, 15 feet across. And yeah, I guess it was 20 or so meters long. So that's what, 60, 70 feet long, something like that. And it's a just a rock pool right up in the mountain. But it's quite a reasonable sized piece of water. So I said to the guys, look, this is a much bigger pool than I was expecting. Are you sure this is where everybody swims all the time? Everybody said, yes, yes, yes. We always come here. We were here last week. This is where we come and swim. So I said, okay, but this is a big piece of water. We check for crocodiles because in Africa, in an area where there's crocodiles, this is a big bit of water. Everybody said, oh, no, there's, there's no crocodiles here. Uh, we're up a mountain. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. And then I proceeded to give them a whole bunch of anecdotal stories that are personal to me. My cousin being one in Uganda who walked up a mountain and was about to take a dip in a rock pool almost on top of a mountain, then noticed that there was a three-meter crocodile basically filling this whole rock pool, for example, and other range of friends of mine who had less fortunate experiences with crocodiles. So having given them the sort of 15-minute lecture from the top of this, this rock, one of the more mature students who'd been in the water, treading water this time, said to me, we get it, Mark, we understand, but you know, we've been in here 15 minutes, so there was a crocodile in here we would have been taken by now. And I said, sure, but you need to think about these things. This is not the way that you need to operate if you're going to be on your own without more experienced people with you guiding in the bush. So I then got into my shorts and said to one of the people in the water, so how deep is this water? Can I jump off this rock into the water? And will I hit the bottom? And they said, no, no, it's deep. You won't hit the bottom at all. So I said, okay. 
And I jumped in. And as I went in, I went down under the water, quite a way down, possibly three or four feet under the water. And almost immediately, I just felt this enormous, enormous hit on my leg. The only way I can describe it is as if someone took a baseball bat in both hands and swung it into your leg as hard as they could. It was that kind of force of impact. And it threw my mind, everything sort of going to slow motion. And I also then felt a distinct tug down. So it was this huge impact and then a pull, and then it was released. And then I started swimming to the surface. And I'm thinking as I'm going up because it all happened so quickly what on earth happened there did i hit a submerged log and i thought no that was an impact it must have been a massive fish down there or something and then i'm suddenly thinking no i think this and i put my hand down onto my leg this is now on water and my hand literally went inside my leg and i thought okay this is a big wound i know exactly what this is so as i got to the surface i just said to everybody out of the water probably with uh, slightly stronger words than that um, crocodile. And you can imagine having given that story, everybody's like, yeah, okay, sure, funny, funny. And I was like, not joking, get out of the water now. And then people are starting to move, but they're still not sure whether I'm joking. And I just swam to the edge. And as I climbed out, you could see half my leg was missing. And then obviously, people reacted pretty quickly and everybody was out of that water. Uh, luckily, one of my students was a Swedish nurse, actually. And I had a full day set with me with medical kit and stuff. So She didn't even bother unwrapping the bandages. She just took the cellophane up and put them into my leg hole and then just put one on top to hold them all in there. I sent one of my qualified backup students up ahead to get back up to the the land river to get to the radio, to radio back down to the camp where my friend was to bring my car and bring my wallet with my credit card because I knew I was going to hospital. And by the time I hobbled the mile and a half back up the gorge, he was there and, uh, yeah, jumped in the car. And then we had a three-hour drive to the hospital. I spent the night having uh, about 130 stitches put into my leg, three layers of stitching. It was quite a mess, but I was incredibly lucky. It could have hit my artery. It, it could have taken me down and kept me down. If it had gone for one of the smaller ladies that were amongst the, the guiding students, you know, weighing 50 kilos or so, not my 100 and something kilos, being six foot three and fairly solidly built, it would have been an absolute disaster. So just as well it was me, but it was a really good lesson. And it just shows you how your gut feeling in these situations, you should always trust it. My gut feeling was this was not the place to be. And I overrode my gut and I went in anyway and I paid the price for it. So yeah, that's the deal. Were they apologetic at all, the people who had encouraged and enticed everybody else in? I think it was a huge life lesson for all of them. You know, they're all aware that it's a potentially dangerous situation to walk in the bush with elephants, with buffalo, with rhino, with lion, with leopard, with hippo. If you're crossing the rivers, which we have to do from time to time, obviously crocodiles are an issue. So they know that there's dangers and we train heavily for that. But it just shows you that you can never be complacent, not for one second. If the lion tracks weren't enough of a warning, that certainly was. So it was a very good lesson. And yes, they were apologetic, all of them. In terms of the physical and the emotional impacts on you at the time and afterwards, can we start with the physical impacts, pain and and hospital care and, and stitches and your locomotion afterwards? How did that all pan out? Initially, adrenaline took over and, and dealt with everything. I mean, it was stiffening up and it was a little bit uncomfortable. And I walked up to the vehicle. And then when I drove down to hospital, well, I wasn't driving. My great friend was driving. I I had my leg up. I had it elevated, obviously. And it was starting to ache after an hour or so. It started to throb as adrenaline wore away. And pretty quickly, we went into theater. And then I went under. They they debrided everything. They cleaned it all out, got all the infection as best they could. Or, because, of course, it was dirty water and a crocodile that bit. So the, the potential for infection was high. And then they had to stitch the various layers going all the way up. So, yeah, when I came around, it wasn't too bad. I was on mild painkiller tablets, but it really wasn't so bad. I was okay to walk, but with a stick. 
It was the next morning, actually, when I woke up the following morning. I was in hospital that night, then I went back to camp that next day. And then I slept in camp that night. And the next morning when I woke up, I just said, look, OK, guys, I don't think I can do this graduation. We're going to have to get another instructor in because I, I need to go back and rest because the pain was really starting to get pretty bad by then. It took a few weeks of pain management, but it started healing very, very well. I then got a bad infection. In it. So it, it became very in infected. I had to go back onto antibiotics and they didn't work. They then took a swab and sent it away. And they found there was a very specific bacteria, which is found in, funnily enough, only found in crocodile mouths and dog mouths, apparently. So they put me on very specific antibiotics for that bacteria. Uh, that cleaned up pretty well. And then I was OK. And I got back to walking pretty quickly. But every few months, as the scar tissue started to break down, another pocket of infection would release. And I, I, I would get fever and you know, my leg would start really hurting. And it would be a problem for, for a week or so. And then it would clear up again and then I'd be fine. And, and I think it took about a year for it to be completely and utterly done and finished. You know, physically, not too bad. I'm very lucky. I, I have very little impact from it. It could have been considerably worse. OK, so no lasting effects now? You, you don't get any twinges now? No, I have no feeling really below. So a bit just below my knee and all the way down my shin and my calf on my left leg, I pretty much have no feeling, which is interesting. So you can stick a pin in there and I don't really feel it. But apart from that, no lasting effects now. Okay. And what about you being treated as prey? You see this sometimes in write-ups and interviews of people who've experienced being a prey item. They say how much it is a fundamental transformation at the time and afterwards. But I guess it's not quite the same for you because you are trained for those kinds of things. So you're set up for that. Yeah. Anyway, how has it affected you to any degree? Yeah, I mean, you're right. So I think these kind of traumas and post-traumatic stress, the benchmark is different in, in different people with different levels of training and different circumstances. So a couple months later, I think two or three months, I think this was the October it happened. And at Christmas, the camp was empty. So I spoke to the owner of the company and, and asked if I could go up and spend Christmas there with my parents who were over from the UK at that stage. And so we went up there and had a lovely Christmas. And, and we actually walked back down to that pool and sat there and had a sort of picnic there and just watched. And the crocodile was still there and it came up several times. And we saw it and it was quite interesting because that, that was going back to the spot and going to actually sort of confront the animal. I mean, I obviously held absolutely no ill will towards the animal at all. I mean, I, I was completely in the wrong. It, it was a stupid thing to do and I knew it and I paid the price for it. But it was very interesting to emotionally go back and confront it. And it was a, it was a good feeling to almost make peace with everything that had happened. I didn't feel any particular trauma per se. I was straight back as soon as I could physically. I was back into walking. I was back into the Kruger trails, which we did further south. And on those trails, we crossed the rivers on some of the trails. On the Elephants Trail, for example, we crossed the river fairly frequently. And obviously, we're very careful about where we cross. But sometimes you have to cross knee deep or just above knee deep, and the water can be murky. And you never know. And I certainly have my eyes wide open, but I wouldn't say that I live in fear of being taken again, but it does happen. It's something you have to be incredibly aware of in the same way that you have to be aware of the hippos that are there and the buffalo that come down and everything else, you know. Is there a crocodile warning sign now at that rock pool? No, Rick, you know, it's inside a national park, so there's no general public there. To go there, you have to go with a qualified ranger yeah, I mean, I think there was a directive that came out that there was no more swimming at that or any other pool in that concession after that incident. I don't think anybody would have done, but I think there was an unofficial ban, or an official ban, I should say. It's not a public spot, so there wouldn't be just general people going in. And I guess this thing about survivors of shark attacks and uh, crocodile attacks and, and other large predator attacks who say the time in the grip of the predator affecting them as they experience being a prey item and having to struggle for their life 
you didn't quite experience that because you were sort of half wondering what it was. You weren't entirely sure that it was a crocodile at the time. So you didn't quite have the I'm being treated as prey moment to reflect on. Yeah, absolutely. As it happened, I hadn't figured out what it was. I literally had to go through my process in my mind of, you know, okay, what was that? What could it be? Okay, I was pulled. So it was something that actually got hold of me. You know, could it have been a fish? No. You know, what's big enough? Ah, okay. Crocodile. We've just been talking about those. But by then I was already on my way up. What had happened, I'm absolutely certain, Rick, was that we walk the whole time in the bush. It was hot. So we wear shorts and we wear boots for walking and we wear short sleeve shirts so, and hats to keep us off, off our heads and face. So our arms and our legs are very, very brown. But obviously, the middle of our torso and particularly feet are snow white because they're under thick socks and boots the whole time. So I think in that deep, cool, murky water, you know, that, that crocodile had gone down to lie at the bottom because of all the disturbance and, and the noise. So it was keeping away from all of this disturbance. And it was probably hot. So it was also lying as deep as it could at the bottom of the pool. Now, as I went in, I would have gone a bit deeper than most people because I'm a little bit heavier. And as I got to the bottom of my plunge and I started kicking to come back up, my little white feet would have flashed in that murky water and the croc would have thought, ah, fish. Bang. Grabbed my leg, thinking it was a fish, pulled, realized that this fish weighed 110 kilos and thought, okay, now that's the kind of weight I am or close to the weight I am. So I'm not going to risk this as a you know, the potential risk to me and let go. And I'm just incredibly grateful that that is what happened. But it was, I'm sure, a reflex action on behalf of the animal. I didn't know what was happening until I came up. Then my cognitive process got involved and I realized what it was. And then obviously I got everybody out and then just dealt with the situation. But we train to deal with these situations. We train to deal with injury. You know, if someone gets a run over by a buffalo or an elephant or something, you know, we have to know how to handle the situation. We carry the equipment to do it and we go through the training to deal with these things. So I just went straight into automatic muscle memory, you know, reaction and just dealt with it. Yeah. Can you tell us quickly about muscle memory? Yeah, so muscle memory is basically when you do when you carry out an action enough times that it becomes automatic. You can do it or you revert to it faster than you would go through a cognitive process. So, for example, we train our guides to use a heavy caliber rifle, which is capable of bringing down an elephant in a charge, for example. They are bolt action rifles. If you are being charged by an animal, and we talked about this the other day with with a leopard, if it's coming at you at 25 meters per second and you've got to bring a, a rifle to your shoulder, open the bolt bring it back, pick up the round out of the magazine, put the bolt forward, close it down, aim at a brain, which is the size of a tennis ball coming at you at that speed, low and fast, and you know hit it. You don't want to be thinking about what you're doing. So that whole process happens automatically. So by the time your brain has worked out what is going on and you're taking aim, you've already got the rifle in the shoulder and you've already got the round in the chamber. Now, that happens purely through repetitive training. And so we have skills and drills for that, that just, we just train, 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 and you develop what is known as muscle memory. So you can do it automatically. It's like driving. That's an example of us here. You don't think about changing gear. Of course, most cars are automatic these days, but driving is a muscle memory. I mean, how many times have you driven somewhere and thought, huh, I don't actually really remember doing that drive. I I just did it on autopilot. That's muscle memory. Training to do something so many times that you don't need to apply a cognitive process to achieve that muscle action. Terrific to have this um, bonus material from you, Mark, at, at this stage. We've also talked about at some stage, maybe when you're around with, with some of us investigators, you doing some training on tracking and trailing. So you're offering that, and we'll see if we can orchestrate that somehow. It is something that is a skill that can be developed, and and then you sort of take it to the next level beyond that. 
but with a sort of understanding of, of the animal you're tracking and understanding what it might be doing and why it's doing it. And you can start to anticipate it. And that, of course, is going onto the real level of trackers. But just in terms of the identification, there's a lot we can do and a lot we can look for. And there's a lot of very simple stuff that is interesting. If we get some time and the opportunity, we should look at doing some sort of a workshop. And it can be on anything. I mean, you know, we can look at tracks for a swan or a, an insect. You know, everything leaves some sort of track and sign. And it's fascinating to see what it is and why it is. Great. Yeah, we'll see what we can fix up with you at some stage in the future, Mark. So thank you very much for joining us again. Look forward to having you inputting to episode 100 if if that can happen. And I'm sure listeners will hear from you again soon. So thanks ever so much for coming on Big Cat Conversations. You're very, very welcome. And Rick, yet again, thank you for all your support and help. We need to be made aware of everything that's going on. And I think you handle it in a professional way way and i think from a huge number of people who listen to this podcast a very big thank you thank you mark very nice to have that feedback and a day after i've just been quoted in the press as saying there are black jaguars about which i certainly (laughs) i didn't utter the word jaguar in an interview yet i'm proposing there are black jaguars about so what chance does that give you there we go thanks ever so much mark all the best a pleasure thank you rick Okay, just an update on Mark's friend, the other Mark, over in South Africa, who also experienced a crocodile attack. The latest news is that he is recovering well and can return to his walking and guiding work, but he has got an issue with his index finger, which was badly injured. That is crucial for his emergency safety firearms work, because if he needs a rifle for emergency situations, his trigger finger is compromised at present. So we wish South Africa Mark well in resolving that. On the Big Cat Conversations website, under the episode 97 entry for the references and links page, we have another example of the way AI, artificial intelligence, can master a topic so effortlessly, because we've reproduced an AI article on UK Big Cat reports. A few episodes back, we heard a clever poem on Big Cats in Britain, produced through AI. Well, now we're reproducing a whole mini-article. You'll see that it really gets to the heart of the subject very well, and it even covers some of the subtle detail that you'd think could only come from a human perspective. Also, another surprise is that it takes an attitude towards the cats, with a very respectful and admiring view. So it's far from neutral in its position. Perhaps this is an example of the slippery slide we're all heading for with the advancement of AI in our lives. And thank you to James, who masterminds our TikTok side of things, for finding and sharing that bit of text. It's once again been a busy few weeks for sighting reports. They've been coming in from all over Britain, and I know Facebook Big Cat sightings groups have had their fair share of old and new reports too. One of our listeners, Joe, in the Reading area, is the latest person to spot a big cat on the M4 motorway verge east of Reading. And that follows ones in past months that Joe was unaware of. Joe said it was sitting, probably just sunning itself, or it may have been sussing out some rabbits, and it was a bit bigger than his Rottweiler. So drive safely on the M4 in East Berkshire, between Reading and Maidenhead, but also keep your eyes peeled. We are soon going to be preparing our instalment for episode 100 of the podcasts. And for that one, we're going to be with a few witnesses and investigators together to do a recording in a pub. We're going to reflect on some sightings and some key issues. So if any of you would like to suggest a question or a talking point for part of that show, do please email it in to rick at bigcatconversations.com. In particular, we would like some distinctly new discussion points. And they could be something that you've thought about because of what's cropped up on the podcasts, or a type of question or issue that you feel we should raise but haven't so far. So anything you'd like to email in by the end of June could be on our list for discussion for episode 100. OK, we'll be back with episode 98 soon, and we have another local newspaper journalist for our next guest. 
He talks about his own particular sighting and his long experience in covering big cat reports in the media and what he feels about media coverage of the subject. Righto, we are signing off now, so thanks again to our guests Mark Graves and to Jane in Somerset. And thanks to James, our TikTok host, for connecting us with Jane. Thank you, everyone, for supporting the show and taking the time to listen. Take care and bye for now.